the podcast that I forgot the name of. It's my own podcast. <laughs> I'm like back with the, the podcast. So who knows what it's called? No, I'm just kidding. I love this podcast and I love you guys that are listening and I read all of your reviews. Um, we have over a thousand reviews on iTunes and everyone's loving it and digging it. And today I have a special, special guest for you. Someone who's very special to me. My therapist, da, 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 da. <laughs> Julia Alper- Alperovich. Close enough. Close yeah. enough. Al- yeah, how, that's good. how do you really say it? Alperovich. Alperovich. Alpovich. Alper- I mean, it's Alper- good. Alper- oh, Alper- Alperovich. Yes. Alperovich. See, it's like Just I don't even keep it a Julia, like Madonna. I'm already so <laughs> self-centered that, <laughs> no, that okay. I don't even know my therapist's last name. Uh, all right. Well, it's and okay. you have your own podcast, which I actually I asked you to do my podcast because I listened to your podcast. And your podcast is, tell me the name, because- It's I called was, Undressing I, the Issue. Undressing the Issue. Yes. Which I have it saved on my podcast, and I just like play it and listen to it. And I was listening to you on there, uh-huh. and you were talking about so many important things that I was like, I need to have you on Worst First, because <laughs> who's better to have you on Worst First than your Worst First patient? <laughs> Oh, Dead. God. I'm sure you've had much worse. Um, but no, I literally annoy Julia. I, I call and text you every day, every time something mildly inconvenient happens in my life. So, uh, yeah, really codependent. <laughs> and uh, it's great. No, she's still here. She still yeah. likes me. So it's good. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to let you kind of start off with what you want to talk about as like a worse first situation. And then we're going to talk more about kind of just situations in general with like narcissists and all kinds of issues that I'm sure people that are listening to this podcast are dealing with. So okay, I'm going to let you drive a little bit. All right. Yeah. I've had so many worse firsts. I don't yeah. know where to start. Yeah. Um, well, how about I narrow it down and you pick one? Okay. 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 So my first session as a therapist ever, which I told you about with oh. a couple, <laughs> that was which hardly. was insane. Yeah. Um, also, my first marriage. Yes. That was the worst. Yeah. Um, what else? Worst firsts. I actually really love your marriage story, and I kind of love how open you are about it, especially yeah. now that you're in a, a great, healthy, loving relationship. And, you know, this happens in life. Sometimes we have to go through these difficult situations that kind of make us realize, like, yes. oh, that's not what I wanted. I want and deserve better than that. And, right. and and it happens to all of us. And I think that's the coolest thing for me is when you shared this story with me because when you hear your therapist say, like, I've been through it, you know, I'm human yeah. and this has happened to me, you're yes. like, okay, that means a lot. So I'm going to let you tell it. I feel like a lot of therapists don't like talking about themselves. And there's yes. this whole thing that we're taught in grad school that we're not to use self-disclosure that, you know, uh, it's all about the client. And if we tell our own stories or if we insert our own experiences, then it's no longer about the client. We're taking away from them or that we're putting them in a position where they're having to take care of us around what's happened to wow. us. Or we're not able to be completely unbiased because uh-huh. then we're thinking if they went through something similar to what we went through, then they must be experiencing it the same way we did. Right, right. Which I'd... Wow, they teach you that in school? Because when yes. you told me your story, I had yeah. a completely opposite yeah. reaction. And the more you actually open up to me and share personal experiences with me, I feel more relatable to yes. you and I feel like you understand. Yeah. So it's diff- It's interesting. I agree. That. Yeah. For me, I look at it as, so there's certain things I'll share and there's certain things right. I don't share. Right. And I think it's about really knowing what is going to be helpful what's the purpose of sharing am i making it about myself or is this something that is going to be somehow therapeutic for the other person or normalizing Mm -hmm. and what i found is because i work so much with everything surrounding sex and relationships and uh betrayal and trauma and infidelity and addiction and all of this sort of stuff you know a lot of um a the bulk of my practice is in sex addiction and what's called betrayal trauma, which is what I talk about ad nauseum on my podcast. So the betrayal trauma piece, being in the position of the person who's in a relationship with a sex addict, with somebody who's betrayed them, what I find is for people in that position, it's one thing to talk to somebody who understands it, like Mm -hmm. on a textbook level versus the self-disclosure. I find that it's actually 
much more therapeutic because they look at me and they're like, what do you know? Wow. What do you know? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Does someone who has, can someone who has a sex addiction still love their partner? Yes, absolutely. So they can have this sex addiction where they want to sleep with other people, but they can still be completely in love with their partner. 100. Wow. But it's also, you got to understand that sex addiction is not always like wanting to sleep with other people. It can look so many different ways. Mm. (laughs) And that's where people have this misconception where it's like somebody just like, like can't fucking, stop yeah, like everywhere they go. Shit, like a fucking jackrabbit <laughs> just like I need to fucking stick it in somewhere where's a hole right, I just need right. a warm hole yeah. but that's not the case right. I mean there are sex addicts who are sexually anorexic who have so much shame around it that they like avoid it at all costs but it's like this obsessive thing it's like white knuckling like a dry drunk and so they don't have sex yeah. at all some of them not well even they'll with go their in like cycles with it like they'll they'll do something Like they'll act out or whatever. They'll have a sexual experience. And then from that comes so much shame and despair and guilt that like all of a sudden it it just like turns off for a while. Wow. What makes people feel guilty about having sex? All sorts of fun stuff. Religion. Oh, yeah. Shame. Yeah. um, Guilt. How they're raised. Trauma. Trauma is a huge one. Wow. Trauma is big. That screws people up. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And it Hello. keeps me in business. <laughs> Dead. Yeah. So fuck up your kids and come visit Julia. We'll put her info at the bottom. Just kidding. There you go. Um, so, okay. So do you want to tell the story about your first situation? Ugh. Would you say he was a narcissist? Yes. Okay. So this is like a narcissist. And I, and what would you define, just to break it down to my audience, would you define as a narcissist? So they kind of understand. Oh, I did an episode. I know on you this. did, and I loved it, and I loved it, and I loved every bit of it, and I was like, ah, I totally get it. So, yeah. one of the things that I preach to people about narcissists, because I have so many clients who come in and they're like, my spouse is totally a narcissist. I read the DSM. <laughs> <laughs> Dead. You're I like, know that's you what really? it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. I really went bitch. all over Google. Yeah. They match everything, I swear to God. I Wikipedia <laughs> narcissist, right. and I could right. totally imagine its photo <laughs> being there. It just looked like it would fit. Yeah. yeah. For okay. sure. Yeah. But here's the deal. So people will exhibit narcissistic traits at different times Mm -hmm. for different reasons. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't a full diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. Right. But these traits are like egocentrism. It's all about me. Grandiosity. I'm the best. I have to be, you know, perceived in the most positive way. Mm -hmm. I have to be you know, the the cream of the crop. I think that's the saying? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, yes. Um, But it's it's this like... It's essentially all about them. It's all all about them, but it's also no accountability. Oftentimes, no empathy, no remorse. But it's but there's different types of narcissists, mm-hmm. and you sent me a link to. I sent you a link to a guy who was describing narcissists, and he was saying there's a a vulnerable narcissist, and then there's the one you just said, the, the grandiose. grandiose. So there's different names for it: the vulnerable, the grandiose, the overt, the covert. I call them fragile and malignant. Okay. And by, his name's Doctor Grande. <laughs> I know. I was like, can I get a fucking latte with that? Yeah. Can I be called Doctor Gordita? Like- yes, <laughs> for sure. We can call you that. Okay. Cool. So that's how this podcast is going to be reintroduced. Perfect. Dr. Gordita is here with me today and uh, she brought some sour cream. So, OK, I love sour cream. Me too. Me too. OK, good. <laughs> yes. So um, so he kind of covered it pretty accurately. My whole issue with his coverage of it is that he doesn't really touch on like what happens when someone has an addiction uh-huh. and has that like addictive mentality where they start thinking like an addict because mm-hmm. People who have addictions, it's not just about that behavior, that substance that you're addicted to. It's pervasive. Like, it affects your global functioning, Mm -hmm. meaning everything you do is going to be affected by addiction. So the way you make decisions, the way you regulate your emotions, the way you seek attention or validation, the way that you interact with somebody and look for security or safety, it's... You know, when your brain has been altered by addiction to look for like instant gratitude, basically quick fixes, you're going to start seeing that in all different places. And with narcissists, if you look at somebody with narcissistic traits, what they do is they they kind of engage in these maneuvers and manipulations to get that quick validation, that ego boost, that reassurance 
you know? So it can, you can see those traits in mm. somebody with an addiction, which is why working with sex addicts, I see a lot of narcissism. Oof. But just because somebody has those traits of that, you know, egocentrism, that lack of accountability, the blaming, the mm, lack um, of empathy. Yeah, doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, they're, they're like narcissists. American psycho. Yeah. Right. Is, are, are almost all <laughs> psychopaths narcissists? So, psychopath. Yeah. So you're talking about sociopaths. Is that what a psychopath is? A psychopath? I mean, yeah, that's like lay terms. Right. And I always find it hard to determine because psychopath, I think like psychotic. Right. And when I think psychotic, I think of the clinical term, which is like hallucinations, delusions, like, right. you know, talking to voices that right. nobody else hears. Right. Um, but there's sociopathic, which is what we have all those like s serial killer documentaries. The fact is most sociopaths walk among us and are not necessarily physically violent. I know. <laughs> Be yeah, afraid. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> but they're scary people. Yeah, but they're not that scary. Most of them have I do have some clients who are sociopaths mm -hmm. and I've had to tell those people, some of them, that that they, they have that I'm worried about that. Yeah. How do you how do you see that in someone? So first off, clinically, it's called antisocial personality disorder. Okay. That's what sociopathology is. Okay. Um, so the one client that I saw it in, he he's a surgeon. He is very well off, but he was he's a plastic surgeon, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, he was intentionally grooming the women around him to be able to take advantage of them and violate their boundaries. Oh my so God. he would like butter them up and then offer them like a free procedure and basically then um, perform sexual acts on them while they were like under anesthesia or yeah, like it's a total boundary violation. It is intentional with the awareness that this is not OK. I mean, this is like would he get in trouble? He almost lost his license. He had to pay some hush money, just saying. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It what happens. the fuck? It happens. But with that, he has, for example, I did a lot of couples work with him and his wife, and his wife would sit there, like, hysterically crying, like, <gasps> yeah. like ugly crying, just pouring her heart out, and talking about really painful, dark shit, like him beating her up and leaving her on the floor, beating up their kids, and he's just like... Yeah, sorry I did that. And I'm like, are you actually sorry? Because, like, lights are on, no one's home. I don't get any emotion. He's like, yeah. I go, are you sorry because you're supposed to be? He's like, well, yeah. I mean, it's in the past. <laughs> so, How is his wife still like, with That's him? fucking dark, man. <laughs> How yeah. does the wife stay? There's, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. So it reasons. usually yeah, is so in these things. It's yeah. usually complicated. But he's... But, you know, with that, it's this awareness that I had to give him of like, look, you know, this is a problem. Most people don't lack these emotions to the right. degree that you do. That's right. not quote unquote normal. I fucking right. hate that word. Right. But I'm like, you know, there's a problem here. <laughs> is and it a mental disability or is it kind of happening from childhood kind of thing? Well, he, I believe his father yeah, was a sociopath okay. and just horrifically abused him growing up uh -huh. and like emasculated him and right. belittled him and you know he has this sort of it's like compensatory like he's trying to compensate for being made to feel really really small wow yeah. it's very it's very crazy it that is. the the your human body it can be environmental or genetic that you kind of end up Totally. Ha this can end up happening to people. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's really unfortunate in some situations. And I'm not saying like I feel bad for people, but in some situations I do. Yeah. Because if you learn about some people's past, whether they be like criminals or sociopaths or whatever, sometimes when you learn about their past, you're like, well, <laughs> they didn't really have a choice to turn out with how they are, unfortunately. A lot of them are like abused or like, you know, molested or whatever happened to them. Yeah. And it's really unfortunate. It just depends because everybody everybody experiences everything differently. So some people, you know, can go through the same type of trauma and come out totally different. Like one person can come out completely well adjusted right. and empathetic and right. they can like have healthy relationships and so on and so forth. And then somebody else, it just breaks them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's such like an individual thing. And I mean, 
it's kind of all about how you're constructed. You know, everybody's different. Right. Is there is there hope for sociopaths? Like, is there treatment for that, or is it mostly a just true therapy? sociopath? I mean, you can with proper treatment, which is hard to find. Most therapists are not comfortable working with that. Yeah, a lot of therapists believe that that's not rehabilitatable, that it's irreparable. Wow. But you know, the research shows that. There, you can make some marginal changes to help mm -hmm. them not necessarily learn how to empathize. I mean, we try, mm -hmm. but it's also to respect boundaries and to understand, you know, basically that the urge to do something for you at the expense of another is exactly why you shouldn't do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's also a lot of family work around teaching the people around them in their lives that they you know they need to protect themselves that they need to be really firm with the boundaries to not engage in the manipulation in the in the narcissistic traits sociopaths mm -hmm. have a lot of narcissistic traits so malignant narcissists the grandiose ones are very similar to sociopaths mm -hmm. but there's there's differences there's okay. definitely differences they have, they have but they're closer than the fragile narcissist fragile narcissists it's a, it's a lot easier to see the insecurity okay. underneath the compensation so they're secretly insecure people yeah who are posing as you know confident strong people that have their shit together and they think it's secret but oh. usually they're not so slick about right. People can see they're hiding it. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Okay, so it's like the guy with the Porsche who steps out and he's like four foot ten, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you're it's like, like so obvious. He's oh, yeah, I see what you're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like your George Costanzas. Yes. <laughs> or like I'm gonna drive this sports car and have a, a twelve year old on my right. arm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh my god. But then you see the guys who are like subtle and understated and who are pretty magnetic and charming. A lot mm. of those malignant narcissist types are really charming. Wow. They're, people tend to gravitate towards them. They tend to be attractive. They carry themselves confidently. And that's part of, it's part of the shtick. Right. You know? Yeah. So, okay, so was your ex-husband a... He had narcissistic traits. So at, he was very charming. Right. Very so when you first met, you were like, this guy's got a great personality. Well, when I first met him, I was like, ew. But <laughs> <laughs> That's a great reaction no, to was. have when you first meet your life partner. Yeah. Fucking ew. <laughs> this guy smells like goddamn cabbage. Get him away from me. <laughs> no, he was, well, he was an ogre. Like, <laughs> Oh, my God. No, he was. He was. He was a huge dude. He was like six foot six, like 280 pounds, like. Jesus. Yeah, like when you walk into a buffet with him, they're like, oh, fuck. Yeah, we better get more <laughs> like, fucking crab shut us legs, down. Diane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, he's a big dude, and he was like completely like big bald. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. So you were married to Mr. Clean. I was. Like a cross <laughs> between Mr. Clean and Shrek. Like <laughs> That sounds yeah. fucking terrifying. Yeah, so he, and at first I was kind of intimidated, but, and also like, I met him on Match.com. I consider what? it an epic fail, by oh the way. <laughs> They're one of my sponsors. No, I'm just kidding. Imagine. And this episode sponsored by Match.com. Get your own narcissistic ogre today. Right? Sign up. <laughs> Match.com. You can get emotionally abused exactly. and traumatized for years. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I'm match. never going to be a spokesperson for them. Sorry. Yikes. So uh, I met him. He was, this was like early Match days. Whoa. This is a long time ago. Yeah. I'm older. Like than over I 10 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So um, it was like dial up match dot com. <laughs> <much. laughs> yeah. I remember those days. Yeah. So uh, he was the only date I went on, the only email I responded to. Wow. And we went and really what attracted me was his personality. He was more of a wise ass than I am and he can carry a conversation and there's a good banter and he has a sense of humor and he's charming and he's a gentleman and he like, you know, yeah, he, he really laid it on thick. And you were like, damn, I thought I was the one that had all these qualities and he he brought it to the table. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I thought I was the narcissist. <laughs> so <laughs> I might be. Wow. So he was just charming and it was like the personality attraction before the physical attraction. Right. And 
I fell for that. And then eventually I was like, okay, fine, we can do it. You're like, I can look past him being green and bald. So like, I can look past that. <laughs> I He's got totally a really look good past personality. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was how we got together. Mind you, I was 23 years old wow. when we met. Yeah. I was I was a young and I was baby. a baby. I was like, I'm in love. Yeah. 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 So um, we meet and we start dating and he says all the right things. I want to take it slow. I want to, you know, get to know you. I really like you. And probably legit to some degree. But like 10 months in, he proposes. Wow. I was completely blindsided. You had no idea. No clue. And... At this point, like, our families met. Wow. You know, we met each other's families. Our families loved us. And everything was great. Of course, I, being 23, I was like, yay. Yeah. I'm a princess. So (laughs) I was like, yes. So. Oh, my God. All my dreams are coming (laughs) true. Fairy tales are real. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, right? Uh, We're like. (laughs) Then the reality like a nightmare, in. Yeah, right? Yeah. I was not prepared for this, but okay. anyway, so we get engaged, and our engagement was a long one, and there were tons of red flags, like but years of engagement, like almost two, yeah. And what were some of the red flags? Um, just for anybody so who's engaged during or that or engagement, right my parents were going through their uber messy divorce. Okay, and basically, he sat me down. And he was like, you know, um, I'm not cool with marrying into a broken family. That's not what I signed up for. <laughs> like it's your fault that your parents are getting divorced. I was like, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, you... let me call my parents and tell them to right? hold off till after we're married. Right. So there was that. There was, we got into an argument and he like punched the cabinet in the kitchen and broke his knuckle. And it wasn't like anything monumental, but I was like, pissed about. yeah, yeah. It's like, what's your beef, dude? Like, dude, I asked you why you didn't eat the toast. Yeah, yeah, fuck uh, yeah off. crazy, dude. So then the other thing that started happening is like closer as we moved along in the engagement, we got closer to the wedding. Uh-huh. The sex was just like steadily dropping off. Right, and I was like, mm. dude, you got to get it while it's yeah. hot. Like, <laughs> I'm still in my twenties. These aren't going like, to be up this here is forever. Fresh. Right, this is prime real estate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, and it won't be forever. Right, as we know. So I have a little cowlick going here. It's okay. Here. It's good. It's beautiful. Good. I like it. You like? <laughs> so, um, so the sex are dropping off. Sex saw starts red dropping flags. off. Right. So we get married, and meanwhile, he's like pushing my family to pay more for this wedding, and he wants it to be even bigger. We got married at Ohika Castle. I think that's where Joe Jonas got married. Where is that? It's in fucking Long Island, like overlooking the Sound. You know, it's like elaborate and it's like a ridiculous castle. Yeah, it is. And so we get married in a castle. Okay. Wow. So um, there were all of these just weird little things started happening. So we get married and, you know, the first year of marriage was really tough. (laughs) I'm in my first year again, but it's a hell of a lot easier this time. Right. Um, And not only did it start dropping off, but I started... Like, I would wake up at night and find him in the guest room, like, watching porn and masturbating. And I was like, bro. Did he do that while you were engaged? Didn't catch him, but I'm sure he was. Yeah. Wow. And and this is after I would, like, try to initiate and get turned down repeatedly. Right. That does a number on your self esteem. Hell yeah, it does. So Been I there. was right. I was like, I'm not desirable. My husband doesn't want me. My husband's not attracted to me. Right. So on and so forth. And like, I totally internalized it. It did right. a number on my self esteem. Right. Anywho, I kept catching him doing that, and he would always just like weasel out of it. Like, oh, well, I didn't want to wake you. I got it's horny. not sexual. You know, when I was single, this is part of my daily routine. This is part of my release. This is how I relax. I'm like, well, it would be fine if there was sexual shit going on with your wife. Right. But when there isn't, and that is what's happening, you've turned me down and replaced me with Rosie Palm and her five friends. Like, how am I supposed to feel? <laughs> Horrible. Right. Yeah. Right. Fuck Rosie. Yeah. So that's fucked up. And they don't even really have sex. So how do you be getting off to this? Like the girls on there are just like getting a paycheck. So right. I don't know. Anyway. Well, it's not about that. Right. It's about this like, I want what I want. Right. Ugh. So. 
And when you came to him about this and told him, like, you're hurting me, you're, yeah. you know, I'm hurt. Yeah. I want to feel, you're making me feel not desired, yeah. right? How did he respond to this that? This isn't about you. You're making a big deal out of this. You're going to school to be a therapist. You should know masturbation's normal and healthy. Like, completely flipped it on me. I mean, this is like gaslighting 101. That's what I was going to say. That's what gaslighting is, right? <laughs> yes. When somebody does something abusive to you and then tries to convince you that you're the crazy one. And yeah. what you're feeling is not right. Not necessarily not abusive, right. but it's like a way to deflect or even um, like blame shift or right. lie in a way where the other person feels like they're crazy, like they did something wrong. Right. So it's exactly what he did. Oof. So, and he did that repeatedly throughout our marriage. So then there were all of these different instances, like he went on a business trip. He started, he worked in, I don't know, some sort of- uh, Medical sales or something. No, it was- <laughs> it was uh it was like real estate management but um it was like commercial real estate and uh -huh. he would like run a bunch of buildings and then he was building out new projects for them and heading up all like the projects right anyway um he started up a project in ohio i want to say so he had to fly out there quite a bit like and what's quite a bit like Every other week from like Monday to Thursday. He'd be in Ohio. Yeah. And so you'd be by yourself in a, out here. Yeah. Okay. Well, in Jersey. In, Ju in Jersey. Okay. Yeah. This was in New Jersey. Yeah. So he used to have to wear suits. Okay. For work. And so when he would travel, he would bring like a garment bag. So he doesn't, you know, completely wrinkle his suit. Right. So he comes home and the routine was I would always take his suits out and like empty out the garment bag and bring them to the dry cleaners. That's such a nice wife. Right. Yes. It's very sweet. Yeah. Some wives are like, unpack your own fucking garment bag. By the way, I love these Chanel shoes. Can I get them? Like, <laughs> seriously. Well, that might be me now. Yeah. <laughs> I've been jaded. Okay, wait. Wait, <laughs> I'm dead. Okay, it's time. I have to take a quick break. We're going to come right back, and we're going to hear what happens with Julia Alparvovich. Alper Alper yes. Alparvovich. Perfect. God damn it. My <laughs> therapist on Worst First. Stay tuned. Okay, we're back. Okay, so your husband would go to Ohio a couple times a week right now because yes. he was doing business there. And he, he would come business. home from Ohio home. and you would unpack his, his business suits for him. I would, and I would take him to the dry cleaners. Such a nice wife. And, you know, given the fact that he was fucking enormous, these suits are like goddamn parachutes. So, right. You know, like, so just carrying yeah. like a like a, 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 a fucking circus tent yeah. to the... <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So I was um, emptying out his garment bag and out of the garment bag falls out an open box of condoms. With some missing. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? It's in your garment bag. This is your bag. This is your shit. You've been using this bag. Why are there condoms in it? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So he spins this whole tale about how... His dad gave him the garment bag and, you know, he didn't look in that pocket and it was probably his dad's. His dad's? His mom and dad have been married at that point for like 40 some odd years. I'm pretty sure they're not using condoms. Like, pretty sure that we don't need a goalie anymore. Like, and how goalie old was pulled long ago. Dad right, exactly. That he's fucking pork and shit. Anywho. Oh, boy. But he's not. But this is what he said. And then immediately it turned into, but it sucks that you immediately assume the worst you more gaslighting yeah you never give me the benefit of the doubt you know you jump into just assuming that i'm cheating it's the first place you go you never you know you never work with me on this you just go right into the worst possible case scenario he's like you never think of like the really broad unbelievable story that could possibly be true <laughs> right i was like yeah wow. okay i guess so yeah you believe right. you believed him Wow. Ugh. I tried. But this like... kind of shit happened over and over again. Like there was another time where he was on this trip and he called me and he's like, I just need you to believe me. I'm having a bit of a crisis. I'm like, what happened? He's like, oh, the cleaning lady at my hotel. Um, she's accusing me of trying to sexually assault her. And I think she's just trying to um, extort me. And I just I really need you to believe me. I didn't do anything wrong. And I was like, Okay. What the fuck? Never heard about it again. There was no follow. I was like, are you getting a lawyer? Like, yeah, are what's you happening with the cleaning lady? How I, did this even I come I followed about? up a couple times. He's like, it's taken care of. What? It's taken care of? How? What? So, oh my God. 
we get to the point where we're married at this point for like three years. It's not getting better. Right. And I'm finishing up grad school and um, we're talking about like what are next steps for us because I wanted to start looking for a job. I also wanted to get out of Jersey. I was looking at the Bay Area and he's like, okay, I'll look for a job there too. Let's figure it out. And I go, okay, but now that I'm done with school, let's go to couples therapy and like figure out what the hell we're doing. Like what's going on with this marriage? Right. So we go, he is like, it's her, she's insecure, blah, 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 blah. I love how guys, that's like their go-to. Yeah. She's crazy or insecure. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. they're being a complete dick, gaslighting and lying. But the girl is and they're crazy causing and a lot insecure. Of it. Yeah, that's my favorite. That's uh-huh. my favorite one. Yeah. So it's really easy to go with that. Yeah. I feel like she's it's- She's crazy. That's yeah. like, if you ever hear a guy- Because we've heard that. If you ever hear a guy talking shit on his ex, just know that he's probably the problem. <laughs> right. Because if a guy is going like, she's a crazy person, she's a this, she's the that, like- right away without you even like asking about it let's face it we all have an ex yeah who would probably say something not so positive about right us. so yeah that's, that's true. just yeah. facts yeah so um so in any case we go to couples therapy the therapist gives us homework he doesn't do it i do mine and i confront him and i'm like you're not doing the homework because i think you're done like I, I just think you've one foot out the door. You mm-hmm. feel like what you would have to ask me for in the homework, you know, is not fair to ask me. Right. Which is for me to be a different person. Right. So um, he's like, no, that's not it. Then one night he goes out to dinner with his dad. I was working late. I come home. He comes home and he's like pale as a ghost. And he goes, I I think you were right with what you said. I can't ask you to be a different person. I want a divorce. And I was like, and up until now, I had no idea about anything. We'd been through a lot, fine. So I was like, crushed, like yeah. just devastated. You were trying to work on it. Yeah, I was like, you didn't even try. Like, yeah, we just went to one couple session. One what? couple session. Yes. Jesus Christ. Right. That's unfucking believable. Yeah. One session. Yeah. It's too much for me. I can't handle the yeah. pressure. Yeah. Totally. Wow. Totally. Wow. This okay. is hard. It's really hard. So. Mm-hmm. He, um, the next day after he asked me for the divorce, after I'm like, you know, crying in fetal position, puking, whatever. Yeah. My finest moment. Um, he then goes to, uh, oh, he comes to me the next day and he's like, so I got a job offer in San Francisco where we've been looking. I know this is your idea. I know this is where you wanted to go, but I'm taking it and I'm going without you. So I'm leaving in two weeks and, um, We're in Jersey at the time. He went to college at Delaware and he's like, so I'm going to go to Delaware for the weekend before I leave for the West Coast because I don't know when I'll be back here to go visit my old college buddies. And, you know, you can stay in the apartment for a couple weeks after because the apartment was part of his compensation. But I didn't have a job lined up. I was like, did he show any remorse or feel bad or cry at this point? Sad. Not really. He was just like, you know, I want I want you to remain in my life. You're my best friend. You know, we we should stay in touch, blah, blah, blah. I was like, eh. right? Oh, my God. <laughs> right. What the fuck? <laughs> well, I didn't know about anything yet. So he goes to Delaware to visit his friends. He calls me up, and I was the girlfriend slash wife, still am, who's like, I don't need to go through your phone. I don't need to yeah. look through all your shit. Like, if I feel oh, the need not, to, I'll it's already all shit. a <laughs> dead i'm like nope that's not me i will look through everything i've had a bad experience so i will have to look through your phones i have to but for me i look at it as like okay if i feel the need to there's already a problem i'm probably the problem so (laughs) 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 a ceo of being insecure here we go all right i love it nice no shame in the game i mean but it's an open door policy both ways so you can look through mine i can look through yours right you know yeah yeah so so you felt the so you felt, I didn't, had a feeling. I never did before, but he called me up and he's like, I need something for work. So my boss called me. He needs me to email him something. I left my work laptop at home. 
in are you home can you send it to me or send it to my boss on my work laptop i was like sure whatever yeah i'm like where's your laptop how do i get in it what is this you're so nice i would have been like you're leaving me go fuck yourself go find your own fucking laptop like you're so nice i should have but i didn't yeah so at that point he walks me through getting into his laptop i get in i send his boss whatever we get off the phone and i'm like well Never looked before, and for the first time, I had the sudden urge, and he had a thumb drive in his, like, sticking out of the laptop, so I was like, hmm, what's this? Yeah. So I start going through it, and I found his cache of all of his infidelity through our entire marriage, leading back to, like, four days after we got back from our honeymoon. So this was, like, photos, nudes that he sent that were sent to him confirmation emails that he saved as like pdfs of restaurant reservations hotel rooms flower purchases i mean you name it he even had a document with all of his like logins and passwords for all these different dating and hookup sites like he even saved templates of um the emails that he would send to women when he would try to meet them and like talk to them templates oh my god okay so really quick not to divert from your story but my ex before tommy it was so funny he was like he was a director and he would be like he would send literally the same message to multiple instagram Mm -hmm. models he'd be like hey i'm a director i think you have a really good look like when can i meet you and he would just send it to multiple girls and they would like never respond like these are like you know instagram models whatever anyway totally reminded me of that but go ahead well they probably get that all the time yeah exactly it was the same message so um is it hot in here? Or is it's it just always me? a little warm in here. Okay. Yeah, it's the lights. Sorry. Got you it. can take your top off. No yeah. worries. <laughs> I mean, I have no pants on, but. <laughs> Dead. There's like so a you... mullet of outfits. <laughs> no, like, I love it. Party Wait, down so below. He, so he literally had, he had all a template. This fucking Wait, here's shit. the kicker. So in the template, what he was sending to all of these women was with an attachment, our wedding photos and a letter that said, this is me and my beloved wife who died of cancer. I'm a widower. I know, right? <laughs> I don't even know where to look right now. <laughs> you were, he killed you. Yeah, I was dead. Just dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so glad you beat cancer. Thank look you. at you. I came back from the dead. What the fuck? <laughs> he was telling people that you died? I died of cancer. I died of cancer. I was dead. And that he was this widower and he was looking for, you know, to spoil someone, someone to keep him company because he's just so like. Distraught. Didn't mm. oh. Right. You fucking piece of shit. I swear to God, Julia. <laughs> if I met this guy, I would punch him right in the dick. I probably would, too. I'd probably be the height, too. The perfect height. You probably would. For his fucking ogre ass. <laughs> i just but like, right in the fucking cock. Yeah. What the fuck? I know. I know. This he is, like, you. insane. Yeah, he did. Did you so, just freak the fuck out? I would have been screaming. So I don't know what came over me. I have this weird thing where... Like, when nothing big happens, I panic and freak out for no reason. And then when something, no, correction, when something tiny happens, I panic and freak out. When something huge and, like, monumental and just horrific happens, I'm like, like a fucking ninja. Like you go into shock almost, kind of. Kind of, but I'm, like, still very present and aware and I can, like keep it together and know what to do but i told you like my package is late with ups and i'm like "Ah!" yeah but wait so were you (laughs) sitting there just kind of like so i'm reading this and i'm like who's next who's next i'm like kind of documenting all these girls and then i was like do i call him do i tell him what do i do and then i was like now i'm gonna find them so i go on Fucking social media oh, at the time. This is like yay. before Instagram. Fuck social media. Loving for relationships, <sighs> 2020. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Number one relationship torpedo. Yeah. So I go on Facebook because this was pre-Instagram. Right. This is like early Facebook. Probably MySpace was still around. Wow. This is a while ago. Right. Um, I go on Facebook and I find... One of the girls, no, I think I found a couple, and I sent them, like, a message on Messenger. Hi, I'm and not I, dead. Just, like, spray and pray. Like, see what I get back, you know? Right, right. So I reached out to one of them, and I was like, hi, you don't know me. No animosity, no hard feelings, but I'm so-and-so's wife. Um, I know you were lied to, but I just wanted, like, confirmation that you and him had a thing. You know, I pretty much know. 
And she was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. He told me you'd passed away. And I was like, girl, I know you were lied to. That's why I'm saying I'm not mad at you. It's not your fault. Like, you were also duped. Like, I get it. I go, but I just need confirmation, like woman to woman. Yeah. Did you guys have sex? Right. And she gets all weird. She's like, well, I don't really want to. I was like, so woman to woman, you should know he's got herpes and HPV. Dead. And she was like, <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> I got to call my get doctor. the answer out of yeah. him. Yeah. Fuck. Which, by the way, he gave to me. Oh my God, yeah. the worst. The gift that keeps on giving. Oh my and God. And I'm open about that too. Yeah. So, because I don't think it's a big deal. A lot of people have it. You're like one of like a million thousand hundred. But like here's the people. other piece of it is like, yeah. there's so much stigma around these things. And if you, I mean, look at the fucking research. Yeah. Like by the time someone is 65 years old, I think the statistics are somewhere at like, 70 to 80 percent likelihood that they're going to have some strain sure. of a herpes right, simplex right, virus right, right i mean come on it actually happens it's actually so funny that you say that because i i met this lady recently we we're on vacation her kids got herpes just mm-hmm. oral herpes from yeah. you know just sharing something with some other kid who had it and yeah. now they have it and you know if you and have that can be passed oral herpes and you eat someone out eventually that's genital herpes so it's kind of just like yeah. a very yeah anyway yeah no it's no big deal totally so so I, that's so that's horrible. but i didn't want it right right so, you know you can sue people for that too if yeah they but give it's it really hard unknowing. there's there's there's, it's hard to prove with something like herpes oh. because it can remain dormant in your system. And I For talked years, to my doctor yeah. about it. And but it's different. I think the laws are different with HIV. Oh yeah. Um. But yes, if you know definitively when, who, right, how, right, right. that's a different story. So not a lawyer, but I'm yeah, pretty yeah. sure that there's stuff with that. Yeah. So um. So in any case, I tell her obviously instantly she freaks out. Oh my god, I got to make a doctor's appointment. And I was like busted. Yeah. So I still don't call him. I used to be a paralegal right? in another lifetime ago. <laughs> and I called up a friend of mine who's like a big time divorce attorney. And as I'm calling her, I'm copying his entire hard drive. Seriously? Yeah. And I call her and I go, listen, up until then, I was devastated. Like I was blaming myself. He was leaving me. You were so I was, gaslit. I was so crushed. Yeah, completely. Yeah. I totally he believed He made it. you feel like it was you and 100. your fault. And meanwhile, he was fucking 100. telling people you were dead. Yeah. From cancer. Yeah. And he sent a photo. Yeah. Oh, my. Our wedding photo. <gasps> Did any of the other girls respond? No. Just that one. Just that one. But that's all I but needed. That's all you needed, yeah. But, and so then, so then what happened? So, so then, then I call my lawyer. I forward her the copy of his hard drive, and I was like, so up until this point, we were going to just, like, go our separate ways. Like, no contest, no, no drama. No drama. But right. at that point, I was like, fuck uh-uh. this. Fuck you. So, fuck you, you fucking piece of shit. Yeah. I'm the same way. Like, I'm cool with somebody until they do me wrong, mm-hmm. and then I'm, like, a psycho. So. But in hindsight, I will say... So that whole thing caused me a shit ton of trauma, like that whole divorce, the marriage, the disillusion of it. All of it was awful and traumatic. And I had to do a ton of therapy for myself. I had to step away from the mental health field to like work on On me for a while. But I will say, in hindsight, finding that out as painful as it was, as traumatic as it was, it also helped me get out of that like just total despair and crumbled meh, nothing yeah. into being able to like get angry and get empowered and mobilize basically yeah. to take care of myself because up until then I was just like ugh isn't uh, here's an interesting I find often if like I'm really angry it's really motivating in some ways anger is empowering anger is really like if you can get really angry about something I mean I'm not encouraging people to be angry people but I'm <laughs> saying if someone does something to you that's really unfair instead of being like woe is me and like I am like life is terrible and I'm like the worst get angry because you know it's like a way more it's way stronger and I actually did that in my last relationship I was really sad like you for a while and really hurt and was like god like I must be ugly I must be this I must be that and did a lot of self-blaming yeah and then finally I was like no 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 
fuck that. Yeah. I wasn't the problem in that. I did everything I could in that right, relationship. Right. Everything. I was loving. I was giving off of blowjobs 24-7. Like, <laughs> was hot, took care of myself. Like, yeah. fucking bought him $20,000 suits. Like, I was a fucking sugar mom. Yeah. I was fucking balling. I didn't do okay? all that. I did a lot. I didn't do all I that. I did a lot. Mm-hmm. And to get treated that way, fuck that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that was the only time I was able to come back when I got angry. So anger is empowering, but the danger is it comes with a certain level of righteousness where right. you start getting blamey and like pointing fingers. Right, right. And also you're probably when you get blamey, you're not going to communicate in a way where somebody wants to hear you. Right. You know what I mean? And I talk about this. all. You've heard me talk about this. Where yes. You're not angry. You're hurt. You're hurt. And, and you're that's scared. what anger is. Right. Essentially. It's fear and pain, but right. it comes out that way because it's less vulnerable than saying I'm hurt or I'm scared. Right. So... Uh, anywho, I finally got angry. I called the lawyer and then I called him and then he still denied it. What? Yeah. You're like, bitch, I found the hard drive. Motherfucker, I was like, I spoke to computer. the girl. Yes. I talked to her. I talked to, um, I, you know, I sent her messages. I saw everything. I found it. You've been exposed. The gig is up. And he's like, I didn't do nothing. I was like, what? this bitch. What? I swear to what? God. Don't you just want to fight? Like, sometimes you're like, people. I wish the Hunger the Games excuses was real. <laughs> I hear. And what's interesting is at that time, I had somehow the wherewithal to be like, bro. But now it's funny because having done all that work and being so far away from it, and then my clients come in and like the excuses I hear for like why it didn't count as full blown infidelity, like, well, um, I didn't come, so it doesn't count. Or, you know, we it was just dry humping. So Really? But I'm like, uh. No. Or, for example, well, it's just like talking on social Emotional media. Emotional cheating is very real. And it's equally yes, as painful. and equally as painful, if not more. Like, I remember when I caught, that was another thing my ex did. He would message girls like, you know, you're so beautiful, whatever. Once in a while, one would, you know, catch the bait. And then he'd be like, you know, what's your favorite movies? Like, I'd love to cuddle you and like blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I fucking asked this bitch to cuddle every night and he tells me he's hot. <laughs> like, you're going to cuddle some other fucking bitch? Really? Right. right. Like, damn. It's so fucked. You know what I did one time? What? I booted up his old phone that he left in his house. Okay. He, okay. So he literally was going to shoot something and he gave me a kiss goodbye and we hadn't had sex in forever. And he was like, bye. I love you. I'm like, so proud of you. Blah, 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 blah. Whatever. Some fucking bullshit that used to feed me. <laughs> so I was like, I still didn't trust this motherfucker. I have like a very strong intuition. So I booted up his old phone that was like in a drawer somewhere. I fucking found it. Right. And it was still logged into his Twitter account. Oh, no. And so I go into his fucking DMs and literally five minutes after he left, he's messaging some girl that was a stand in in one of his movies and fucking messaging her, you know, I think you're so this and that. And like, you know, I'd like tell me about yourself and like I'd love to pick your brain and explore your thoughts, like all the shit that he said to me when we first started dating. And I'm watching and watching and watching. And I had to be on set that day and I had to shoot like a, I was shooting like a little web mini series. It was so many lines. And I remember like, I was so angry and I just wanted to fuck. I was just watching them talk. I was just watching because I yeah. could watch on the phone. And then finally when it started to get like, you know, more romantic, I interjected and I started typing and I was like, hey, I'm not going to say his name because even though I want to, I won't. Hey, asshole, it's me, your fucking girlfriend reading all this shit. And his, the other girl was like, huh? And I was like, it's me. I picked up his fucking phone and rebooted it. He has a fucking girlfriend. He's a piece of shit. And he was like, you fucking psycho. I was like, oh, I'm psycho? No, I'm uh, I'm smart is what I am. And I fucking knew you were a piece of shit. And I fucking like, told, and then it, literally five seconds later, he deactivated the phone. He probably called his fucking assistant to have the phone deactivated. And then he called me a psycho. He called me all this shit. I was like, fuck off, you piece of shit. And then the next day sent me flowers and was like, I love you. I'm sorry. Mm. And I fell for it like five times because I'm a fucking glutton for punishment <laughs> <laughs> and until it ended really really badly then it then it was finally over but it was I kept coming back for more because I would fall back into like you know some people I just kept 
we would break up and then I'd be like, oh, like, you know, he's not, I guess like maybe he was just like, bo- you know, I don't know what I would tell myself. I was a fucking moron. And then he would come back around and act like he really loved me and cared about me. Yeah. And then I'd fall for it and then I'd get sucked back in and then he'd go right back to being a piece of shit again. Yeah. It was like a really vicious cycle. So it's interesting because I have a lot of clients who stay. Yeah. How do you After stay? they're cheated on. Well, oh. it's, it's complicated. I mean, they're different circumstances, right? So in some cases, when that person is very, very humble and very remorseful and is like, look, I have this problem and I really want to work on it. And I, you know, I, I'm, I want to get help. I want to get better. I don't want to keep doing this. And I love you and I'm a piece of shit and I'm sorry. And yeah. like, I want to be better. And they actively try. Like, yeah. they're not just continuously doing the same right. shit over and over again. That's one thing. Or it's circumstances like, well, we have kids or it's financial stuff that prevents people from being able to like all of a sudden have two separate households or whatever it is. But, you know, there's there's a lot of like I would say judgment for people who stay after infidelity. And I will say it's not always the best. I think in some cases Of course, not a good idea to stay. This is abusive. This is manipulative. It's unhealthy. But there are some cases where I've seen couples come out of it and come out on the other side having rebuilt trust and also having strength in their relationships where it's kind of like, you know, it's a whole new thing. Right. Whatever was happening there, we've put that behind us. We've gone through this all the work of rebuilding the trust and, you know, repairing all of the damage. And now that we have gotten there and it's better, we've come out on the other side and it just looks totally different. And so, so it it's is possible, possible. It is but possible. it really depends. And everybody, whenever I see these couples, they're like, so how long does that take? I'm like, we're talking like a month. <laughs> they like want a timeline of when they're healing, how their healing's yes. going to happen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the sad part is, is, I have to tell them, like, look, I can't give you a number. Right. It depends on how hard you're both working. It depends on how committed you both are. It depends on what happens in the interim. And here's the other deal. You could get through this and do so much better. And then 10, 15 years down the road, you could still divorce. So is that a failure now? How do you how do you qualify that? Like, there's no guarantees. And that's the reality is anytime you get involved in a relationship, there's no guarantees. And I'm a firm believer that there's no such thing as unconditional love. That makes me so sad. So there's not someone that'll, like, love you no matter fucking what. So if you're abusive to them, should they keep loving you? No. Okay. But I mean... They should have a limit and be able to say, right. I'm not okay with this. So there is a condition. Right. But I mean, like, what if, like, the the one who's being abused is loving irregardless you know, because I've always had pretty much unconditional love in all of my relationships where I'm like, they can keep treating me like shit and I keep trying mm-hmm. to come back and fix shit. But then like, uh, I don't know, it kind of bums me out. Like I'm the one that's kind of like, I have to get I have to give up like it sucks, you know. But how do you think it would be different for you if you were able to place conditions? Do you think that the relationships would go on as long? Do you think that more of the same would happen as it did like how do you think it would go well I think my biggest issue is that I'm an empath and I'm like very sensitive and I'm constantly putting myself in other people's shoes yeah and I'm constantly trying to be like okay you know I'm trying to like feel for them and like if yeah. they protect them and like over coddle them and I know a lot of times in relationships people are like you know if you match with someone who's not into that they're like oh this is too much yeah. like I don't need this much like you know you're not my mom whatever right um so I don't know it's really hard for me but it just bums me out because I'm like a hopeless romantic too because I am that sensitive empathic person I'm like I want someone who's gonna fight for me through thick and thin that's gonna go no we're gonna work on this we're not gonna give up like that to me is like true 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 love so I agree with that yeah I think you're right that that is commitment that's been my whole theme on my podcast this month has been like what is commitment what gets in the way of that and yes it is that through thick and thin that understanding that this is going to require work. It's not going to come easy. It's not always going to be amazing and fun. Right. We're not always going to be, you know, like 
skipping with puppies and farting rainbows. <laughs> like it's going to be hard at times and yeah. there's going to be conflict and disagreement and hard feelings. But it's also this understanding that we're in it together and that even when we have moments where we don't like each other, we still love each other. But that doesn't allow someone to be abusive. Right. So it's, if someone's really being a piece right. of shit, you got to So it's draw still not okay for someone to just outright, like, be, you know, to lie to you or to put you down or to um, threaten you mm-hmm. or to, you know my rules. I've told you my yes, couple rules. Yes, there are, there are great, your great rules. But I also wanted to ask you, and I know it's time to wrap up. I hate this. My podcasts are like an hour. But- I can't believe it's been an hour already because I could keep picking your brain and I have yeah. to have you back on and I know my audience is going to love this. So yeah. I, I want to ask you, what are like the number one relationship killers? Like what do you say are like the top five things that you would say put kill a relationship? Um, God, there's so many. I got to narrow it down to top five. Yeah. So communication is huge huge yeah whether it's a lack of communication or it's poor communication or it's um over communication or demanding communication communication is huge and it's such like a fine line yeah and it's it's almost it's like this nuanced thing that it's almost like an art form to get it right but it's workable right luckily Mm -hmm. um communication is one um trust is another and by trust I mean safety Mm -hmm. so like being able to set boundaries and know that the other person is going to respect them and honor them or if they don't honor them that you know they're going to come back and basically try to course correct or they're going to take accountability and they're going to you know be more consistent about showing up in a different safer way for you right that's huge Mm -hmm. so trust communication and unfortunately i feel like in this day and age we have to talk about the internet and i feel like it's to get into this i know we need to, to but it's the internet is today with especially with like younger generations but even even our generation well mine i'm a little older but even our generation like the internet is it's just this like cesspool of you know, anonymity, access, and it's, you know, there's no, there's no rules, there's no yeah. integrity, it's just like, I and can do people, whatever. And people look at it like, oh, it's just a, like, innocent little this, and or they, an innocent and little they that, and you're it. like, but if you look at it from someone else's perspective, and take a second, instead of being defensive and look at something from someone else's perspective, you can see right. this is hurtful, in right. a way, you know, because it is, it's like a public forum that everyone can see, you know, and it's people are sensitive about it. But I it. think the piece that can be really hurtful that people maybe don't consider every time is that when you are paying attention, giving somebody attention mm-hmm. on the Internet, yeah. somebody else, you're not giving it to your partner. partner. Yeah. And the more you do that and the more energy you expend on giving it to someone else and not your partner the more hurtful it's going to be for your partner. Or I'll like see these guys on there that are constantly liking my photos and commenting stuff and then I'll go to their girlfriend's pages and they'll like like some of their girlfriend's photos but they're never commenting. They'll like, they'll put like a star on mine or like you look great or whatever and then I'll go to the the girls to their dating's pages and there won't be any comments on the girls that they're dating and I'm like, dude, yeah, that's going to make your fucking wife or girlfriend feel like shit. You're out here like hyping up other females, but you never go on your partner's page and go, hey, like you look awesome or whatever. Yeah. And like it actually makes me like really bummed for the girls. And the guys like are just Duh. like they're just fucking oblivious. Like, oh, it's just the internet. Uh, like, no, dude, like you're that's people's yeah. feelings like for real. Well, I think it's one of those things where you got to be consistent. Yeah. You know, like if you are making it clear publicly that this is your partner and that you support them it doesn't look quite as bad i guess when yeah. you support other women but you don't support your partner right but it's just kind of funny like i will see that and like i, I it kind of bums me out even married guys that message me and shit like that i'm yeah. just like ugh. Ugh. 
like really awful. What was that like? Ugh. Okay. We need to have a whole episode <laughs> where I just throw up into the mic and we talk about this. Yeah. I'm going to have you back on to talk have about me. Let's just do it. internet and how that whole situation is. And I think it's so, you intense. know, some, cause I feel like on like 90% of the time it's the guys going, Oh, it's no big deal. And then it's like the girls who are like, I'm really but also hurt. Porn. And yeah, like porn, not even that, but it's not even porn. You look at social media and I mean, some of those like, pages about you know twerking or fitness models i mean when i was growing up that would have qualified as soft porn. core porn yeah yeah you know yep. and it's so accessible and what is it you know what yeah. are we normalizing what are we yeah. desensitized to it's that's another thing like, heavy i have girlfriends in la who will go on dates with guys and they'll be like the date went awesome i'm really excited about this this seems like it could be a really great thing and then they'll get home and they'll go on instagram and they'll see that he's been liking every fucking naked model who's half naked with her fuck covering her titties photos and it's like i thought we just had a really good date and you're gonna yeah. go home and like fucking this fucking crotch shot with a fucking bagel covering your pussy this is like where i feel old because i don't even know how to like well do that they detective actually, work they actually got <laughs> rid of that feature on instagram where you can see what other people are liking because it caused so many relationship problems actually that's why instagram just got rid of it but if you're a really good detective like I am, or like my friends are, you go into whoever they're following and yeah. go through their photos and see if your partner's I feel like, like the FBI comment. could take a note. With me, for sure. Like, <laughs> I, you could fucking breathe weird on the internet and I will find it. Yeah. Like, I find yeah. everything. I'm a fucking psycho. Like, oh, I, that's how I found my ex cheated on me. Like, I found it. Yeah, on the internet. So, a lot of the betrayed partners I work with, though, they're the same way. Yeah. By the time they come to me, they're like, I know everything. Yeah. I've seen everything. I got the receipts. Yeah. I got the motherfucking receipts. I got the it's screenshots. True. It's yeah. true. You got it's the so motherfucking true. screenshots. Anyway, guys, I know we're at an hour, and I fucking love Julia, and she's a great therapist, and she has an amazing podcast. This is what made me want to have her on here, other than her being an awesome therapist. Undressing the Issue, yeah. available on iTunes, and everywhere. Any, everywhere Sound podcasts cloud, are available. Everywhere, so everywhere you can everywhere, listen to a everywhere. podcast. Anywhere you could ever dream of it. And, um, you know, leave some questions below on issues that you guys want to talk about. Because I'm going to have Julia back on because this has just been such a fun experience. And I'd love to talk more about yeah, this. And obviously, it. it's a totally worst first. Obviously, uh, fits my first with the whole. Marriage. My worst first marriage. My worst first experience with the internet. My worst first experience with being cheated on. Whatever. It's all applicable. And, uh, yeah, thanks for liking and uh, listening to this podcast. And we'll check you out next week on Worst Firsts. Little golf claps. <laughs> that was fun. Thank you so much.